the aims of the modeling work group are to really improve the use of models in Puget Sound recovery um, through in improving dialogue between modelers and model users putting together, um, which we're calling the modeling compendium. This is essentially um, a, a document that's going to um, aggregate sort of a description of the modeling capacity that we have in, Puget, in the Puget Sound region. I think it's been a great tool to help facilitate having that kind of discussion and, and project that uh, population growth and then changes in land, land cover over time. Um, and like I said, we can layer that with some of the other things of what we're trying to protect and make those kinds of decisions. This slide highlights some important modeling gaps that would be valuable to fill, uh, really essential to fill for Puget Sound Basin scale applications. Listed uh, downscaled climate change scenarios was recently filled thanks to Guillaume Maget and colleagues at the UW Climate Impacts Group. Uh, those gaps in the process of being filled or needing more work are listed in the second and third columns. I'll be happy to expand on these during our workshop discussion session uh, a little later. Thanks very much. We've learned from our experience that uh, there are really just a few that uh, play an important role when you're talking about nutrient uh, del delivering nutrients to streams. When it comes to the non-point sources, that definitely decreases <laughs> quite substantially. Uh, we have higher confidence in the um, remote, remote, remotely sensed um, data, like the developed land, forest land, and LCD business, um, and even the atmospheric deposition. But when we get to the farm fertilizer, livestock waste, um, <clears throat> not only are we dealing with uh, larger intervals, but we have to rely on some kind of geospatial modeling to estimate those um, inputs at the um, field level. And but fortunately, in the new sparrow modeling we're developing for the uh, Puget Sound, which is dynamic or seasonal modeling, we are really focusing on refining those estimates for uh, septic tanks, fert fertilizer, and livestock. And um, if we can do that and combine that with our confidence with the point sources, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. It is focused uh, on the Puget Sound watershed and it's focused on uh, urban runoff <clears throat> and the pollutants that come off of urban land. Uh, it's really a, um, a stormwater tool, but I, I think that it has a lot of overlaps with what's already been uh, presented. We have 50 billion rows of results, uh, which is a, a massive amount of results to deal with. Uh, so we've put those all on the cloud on a tool called BigQuery, which is uh, a Google uh, cloud data product which can be used for, for querying these results and assembling them for different areas. Things are gonna be happening, right? Well, so I talked about the calibration of the nutrients, updating the, HR, the HRUs and the egg, but also it could be that we, you know, if we're doing nutrients, like we've seen some other people mention as well, you know, on-site septic would, could be a pretty big factor. Um, also age of development might be another big factor. So we'll be, when we also model as well, uh, and, um, so LSPC can provide the hydrologic and water quality inputs into kind of almost any kind of model there is because it is a time series and you can always you can always roll up things and aggregate things much simpler than to disaggregate. So potential for nitrogen controls it, uh, as agricultural BMPs um, to prevent nitrogen runoff into the system, but we're also thinking with King County more broadly about <clears throat> how to integrate many models like the ones discussed today, but typically we would rely on other models for larger kind of hydrologic systems assessment. But in these cases, um, these man-made networks aren't handled well within many existing watershed models. Um, you can see how they overlap with many of the model inputs discussed today. Um, as I said, in this example, we would be looking at every agricultural Field individually. Modeling inputs uses the land cover, um, the national land cover database um, as inputs, and it projects parcel level land cover change into the future. It's spatially explicit and includes a multi agent approach to change modeling. Um, and most importantly, in terms of outputs, it's very much um, covering the gamut of what we've been looking at here. So, population growth, hydrology, uh, land cover change, climate impacts. 
and uh, particularly um, habitat provisioning. Uh, a systematic framework um, that is applied to Puget Sound recovery goals and vital signs rather than a specific um, model or decision support tool input. The importance of climate change inputs across all efforts um, for modeling future scenarios and watersheds. We've included a slide here highlighting the, the climate impact group, the initial considerations that uh, Guillaume has provided to us here on how to address downscaling and application of regional climate change models as inputs to future scenarios. We should consider and use a range of projections and processes um, of downscaling, whether it's dynamic or statistical, should also include a, um, a bottom-up assessment of the sensitivity for that specific application or model. Really, that there's not a one-size-fits-all with one particular projection. Um, Guillaume also kindly highlighted the Snover et al. Uh, 2013 paper listed there and will be in the links. Um, and this is a good synthesis and guide uh, when taking into some of these considerations for, um, for downscaling. Uh, we've also listed a number of the hydrodynamic uh, models that are relevant to China, climate change input. Um, there are many, many more that are specific for, for particular purposes, such as flood risk. Um, of our inputs, I um, have pretty high confidence in that because of the uh, approach that's used to estimate it. Uh, and we get it straight from the, uh, the Lima group at OSU, and it's a, um, it's a, it's a 30 meter raster basal density and um and that that source is a pretty strong predictor of in-stream nitrogen load uh, with uh you dan uh you know it's it's a great data set nitrogen uh into streams by alder and in many cases it improves the productivity of stream invertebrates uh that are important for salmon so um we have to be careful how we think about that as a, a problem. On one hand, feeding nitrogen into the estuary um, is a problem, but you know, compared to other nitrogen inputs, it's probably not in most places uh, as big of a problem as uh, really dwarfed by, by some of the other inputs that we've been talking about uh, today. I just thought that was a really good point that, that Bob made about um, productivity in the streams. And I just wanted to point out that overall nutrient concentrations in Puget Sound streams are pretty darn low. They're um, for the most part below half a milligram per liter and you know rarely except for in a couple of cases above a milligram per liter. Um, so it's well established now that uh, young forests um, managed on short rotations, in other words, uh, consume, uh, transpire much much more water than older forests. Uh, up to two to three times more water gets transpired in, say, a 40-year-old forest compared to a 80 or 100-year-old forest. And that has the effect of reducing summer low flows, um, especially in August, um, September, early October, uh, when spawners are, are trying to get upstream. And so we've been working with um, tribes uh, in the Puget Sound region to look at using uh, alternative uh, forest practices. When I say alternative, I mean uh, alternative to um, the industrial forest uh, approach uh, with short rotations. And so the community, uh, Nisqually Community Forest is actually using um, ecological forestry practices, long rotation, 80 uh, years or so, uh, which is at the point where forests uh, are using about half as much water as young forests. And so that's been put into motion. Uh, other, other tribes are, um, and the Nisqually tribe and, and Nisqually community forests are, are taking that up. And um, we think that, uh, over time, there are other things that can be done too to help mitigate uh, low flows at least. Contribution from non-alder forests is, is pretty small, generally. To, to estimate the contribution from different sources out there in those areas, we're, we're using some kind of geospatial modeling based on data that is kind of coarse to start with. So, you know, we have an estimate of geologic phosphorus 
And, and out in those areas, uh, it's really two players for phosphorus. It's geology and possibly um, uh, grazing cattle. And if you saw the slides that Christiana presented at the Nutrient Forum, she pointed out an area where um, it really, the, the model really missed the mark on the west slope of the uh, Olympics there. Um, and that really had to do with the fact that it's a, it's a, they're, they're low phosphorus yields and the model struggling with what it has, which is um, some estimate of background phosphorus and some estimate of raising cattle that probably were attributed to an area that they shouldn't have been. Um, and that's what we struggle with is when we create the input, you know, we have to delineate areas uh, where cattle can be if they're grazing. And then if we miss that, then that gets propagated through the modeling. Um, so in the next round of modeling for the Puget, we're really focusing on refining those ag inputs. So we really get a good handle on that. And the reason I asked this question is we actually measured it using um, o, the O17 isotope of oxygen, which is uh, a known dead marker for atmospherically derived nitrate. And we hardly can see it in the waters. We only see it in, in rivers that are dominated by snow melt and at certain times of year. And so our interpretation is it's only a really meaningful fraction of the total when you involve systems with high snow because nitrate's known to be kind of scrubbed out of the atmosphere by snow. And we never see it in any other system. So I'm wondering if that kind of matches what your models say or conflicts. I could say with the Sparrow results, you do see similar, a similar pattern that mm -hmm. there's a signal from atmospheric deposition lower in the watershed, but it really just gets uh, swamped out by point sources, ag, and urban runoff when you're getting down to the mouths of those rivers. And we've looked at LC map, we've looked at land trender, we've looked at uh, CCAP over and over and over again. They're just terrible at mapping urban, uh, urban land cover change. And they even, much to my surprise, did, did produce a paper that compared them a few years ago in forests, I think, and it said that on average, all of these models miss 80% of the change that occurs, and about 80% of what they do map is actually erroneous. I just keep people to think about there's many things that go into the hydrologic landscape, not just land cover, that have their own commission omission issues. We based on our evaluation of, of some of those data sets. Uh, we found that uh, a lot of the data sets like the um, NLCD data set that's developed for the entire country uh, has more error in our region um, just because those models need to calibrate and predict across a, a large area. And Land, it's not one thing that's really gonna be your final product. It's a, it's a compendium of a whole bunch of landscape features much monitoring data available is available for calibration and and to verify the proposed models and if we need to put some more resources um, into site-specific data collection for model development that's followed by Lynn's uh, Schneider's again um, that that she's specifically curious if we need more data to demonstrate the contributions from on-site sewage systems uh, I I would uh cast a vote for uh, urban contaminants and just trying to get a handle more on the deposition, the uh, residues, uh, pools that are, are legacy pools, especially for things like six um, uh, PB, PCBs, um, PBDEs, things that are ending up in the food web uh, all the way up to orca and salmon. Um, to keep in mind the the processes like large lakes, right? You can monitor what's going in, but what's going out is going to be something different because there's there's all sorts of nutrient cycles going on, and 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 um, so just.